If there's anyone down the back who missed out on a seat or, um, or you're a senior Aranda person, please come here. <laughs> sit here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming everyone. We might just get started now. Uh, the NT Writers Festival would like to acknowledge the Urunda people on whose land we meet today as the traditional owners. So thank you. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone who's here today. Thank you for coming. Um, and it's not just us here in this room, it's also people uh, live, live streaming from all over the Territory. So welcome to you as well. Uh, Kieran, you're the founding, one of the founding journalists of the Alice Springs News, established in 1994 and now online. Uh, you studied in Sydney and Paris in arts and film studies, and you moved to Alice Springs in 1987. Kieran's been published in uh, arts writing and journalism in the Griffiths Review. I can always um, muck that up. Inside Story, Art Monthly, Australia and Art Link. So you've been... And we shouldn't forget the Alice Springs News Online. <laughs> the Alice Springs News the Online. The foundation, really, of all of that. Yes, mm. yeah. Kieran's going to introduce her book today, uh, Trouble, On Trial in Central Australia. So, thanks, Kieran. Uh, well, the question um, posed for this session, and overall it uh, will be a question and answer session. I'm not going to take long. Um, but the question is, why these stories of trouble when there are so many stories to tell? And I want to particularly acknowledge that. So I've just written a few thoughts. Um, as we've been reminded in this festival, Stories have been told by Aboriginal people here for many thousands of years. And this morning, during a walk along the river, a group of us also heard some of the hard stories of recent history from local Aboriginal perspectives and also about the persistence of their knowledge of country. Amongst the settler population for a long time, the hardy pioneering town was the dominant story. In recent decades, that story has been forced to recede. The old settler ways have come critically under pressure from contemporary Aboriginal ways. Both Aboriginal political voice and strength, as well as the weight of all those things that get summed up as Indigenous disadvantage. The Alice Springs I've come to know over the last three decades is a town in transition, often painful transition, occasionally impressive. This festival and the explorations of its themes of crossings, Awara is an outstanding example. But as a town in transition, it is still uncertain as to its future, and that is where I place my hope. It is a future that we can take in our hands, and this festival is a step along that way. I always thought that if I wrote a book about Alice Springs, that my focus would be in those areas where I sense great potential for changing the story. And that's particular in the area of cultural work. And not in this area of great trouble, which in often crude form has come to be the dominant story told about Alice Springs. The division, the violence, the alcohol abuse, and often all of those viciously intertwined. I surprised myself when I began to see through my experience in the courts a way to tackle the trouble story head on, to put flesh on the bones of what we know through the terrible statistics and the news reports, to situate the story in the context of everyday life in this town, in this region, in the camps, the flats, the houses, the rivers, the bars and bottle shops, the streets, the highway, the drinking camps. For most days of trouble are ordinary days until that moment from which there's no return. Inevitably, the framework of my book is provided by the courtroom, 
Its containment gave me a form and the stories for what would otherwise have been an overwhelming endeavour. What we see is not the reality of events as they've been lived outside, but between questions and answers, submissions and counter-submissions, charges and verdicts, something of that reality infiltrates. People bring it in, <coughs> and often quite assertively. It's particularly by being alert to the ways this is happening that allows me to describe something of the evolving relationship between Aboriginal people and Australian settler law to show the human face of that interaction. I don't want to diminish the importance of systemic structures that try to contain the trouble and that also in many ways contribute to it. But I also want to observe the ways in which individuals try to make a difference and do make a difference. Aboriginal individuals, non-Aboriginal individuals. And in the accumulation of small actions and of understanding, perhaps we can find the momentum to drive change, broader change. And finally, I just want to make a few reflections uh, on the thoughts and images heard here at the festival that seem very relevant to my endeavour in this book. It won't be comprehensive, but uh, I'll start with the moving and generous comment by Margaret Kamara Turner, it was read by her daughter Amelia on Friday night, that the two cultures can hold one another. I hope my book can be taken in this spirit as an offering towards greater understanding between the two cultures. Augustinus Wibo at the opening recited a marvellous poem set on the border of uh, Afghanistan and Tajikistan, uh, a border formed by a 20 metre wide river that's uncrossable. He evoked the people travelling on the very different roads either side of the river, looking across at one another uncomprehendingly. I was thinking that here in Alice Springs we're often in the river, sometimes in tragic encounters, we're often floundering, but also sometimes in warm and open meetings with one another. These are the best of times. Someone asked Tim Lowe yesterday how to be a good naturalist. He said in a word, community. He was talking about us tuning into the life of birds, for instance, as part of the life of our community. It shifts perspective. This made me think about the perennial divisions, the them and us, of much of the way we think about the trouble that is my theme. So the question might be, how can we be good citizens making a difference to that trouble? And a starting point, at least, is to accept that it belongs to our community. It can't simply be cut away, locked away, socially engineered out of existence. I love Therese Ryder's story of listening to the message of the Willy Wagtail, of tuning into it and taking its meaning. Listening and hearing can't be overrated. And there was the image of two countries offered by Craig San Rock's Electra, quoting her brother Orestes. There are in my skull two countries, in the one these furious mothers a warm, dark music there, it suckles me. My sorry mother, wronged and murdered, requires right action. I ask no exception to that rule. There are, in my skull, two countries. Here, <coughs> sharp-edged men call for retribution. Two laws at war in my skull. These warring countries within individuals, within family and clan groups, within the courts and within our wider community are much in evidence in my book. But the two countries have their many places of intersection and overlap, of crossings where we can meet. And to quote Danny Powell as she movingly interpreted the festival's theme, where we meet and neither block or erase one another, but travel together. Such is my hope. So, Kate. Thanks, Kieran.
my first reading of your book, um, I was struck by how provocative it it is in its ability to uh, create intense emotion um, in me, the reader, and how starkly different that emotion was from the usual public debate or discussion where there's almost just a sense of outrage as the commonality coming through. Um, I wondered if you could comment on that or make uh, some comments about emotion through the book in some of the stories or the people you met on the way? There's probably a place for outrage, but it, outrage often um, prevents thinking. Mm -hmm. And I stepped back from that very deliberately um, in my own tone in the book. Um, I try to approach things with compassion but without sentimentality so that I can be true to the facts in so far as we can know the facts and I accept the limitations of that. Um, but at the same time, um, I, don't, I didn't want to be shy of engaging with the emotion of everybody involved um, almost all of the cases I follow uh, are killings and there's no getting away from the profound pain of that for perpetrators. Um, that's often unacknowledged but um, and above all uh, for victims and families and then the ripple out effects um, into their particular communities and into our community. Um, the very high level of violence, I think, undoubtedly affects the emotional tone of our community. Mm -hmm. you, you made a, a, um, a discussion point of uh, hyperbole in public discourse or, or in um, some types of reporting about these stories of trouble where um, you commented that uh, the facts were enough um, often in coronial findings or autopsy, and th there was no need to go outside of that and beyond. Um. Yeah, often the uh, rumour mill around town um, adds to the level of anguish, I think. Um, it, there are particularly uh, co um, constructions of stories that turn out not to be so, for instance, much more aggravated level of violence than has actually been perpetrated, which perhaps doesn't allow the proper context for when there is really terrible violence for that to be appreciated. Um, yeah, I think it's important to suspend judgment until we can know more of the facts. Um, but then there's also a lot of um, exaggerated debate in the way these matters are discussed in the community, um, I don't think that helps at all either, the, the terms of the popular debate, um, which tends to see everything in sort of very reductionist terms and to accept no level of punishment that is ordinarily administered as enough, or calling for more. And I was asked this morning about who I wrote the book for, and I said, for Alice Springs. And my interlocutor looked at me and said, yes, but like, more nuanced, please. And I thought, well, particularly for all the people who call for tougher and tougher law and order responses, and for the politicians and policy makers who feel that they have to respond to that popular call. Um, in presenting the stories uh, um, that are about such terrible events, but in the most human terms. And you see it there before your eyes, enacted in the court. For all its containment, it is there mm. to be seen. Um, in, in doing that, um, I hoped that people could take away the message of it requires human action above all. Mm -hmm. um, 
across the sort of sp spectrum of what we can do as people, which includes care. Mm. Um, there, obviously, there is a pa place for punishment. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, it, it, I, on my reading, I thought you beautifully gave voice to the quieter stories and the, and the quieter people who sat with their pain uh, that maybe unless you looked carefully or tried to see it, wasn't immediately obvious in the usual discourse. Um, and those, those stories and people were peppered throughout your book. Was that important to you to uh, report their stories as well or their parts of the story? Um, well, I think that is one of the things that the book allowed, you know, in um, almost all of these cases, if not all, um, have been the subjects of reports by me from the courts as the cases have been unfolding. And I have paid um, a lot of attention to them. They're not brief reports, um, they, but they have that um, journalistic tone of detachment, um, trying to keep the focus on the facts, um, in part to just steady the debate around those painful subjects as the case is unfolding. But in the book, the book gave me space to really look at what was happening around the court. And it's really where the book came from, seeing the things that people enacted in the court that have nothing ultimately to do with the way the cases are adjudicated. But um, I think they show what people are trying to get out of the court for their own needs and processes. Uh, so, so those of you who have read it might remember a scene where the family come into court and their relative is there uh, appearing by video link and the visibility between him and them would have been very limited but they were all there just to see his face apparently and they're smiling at him and when eventually he's dismissed and he gets up and leaves that little video link room everybody raised their hands and waved to him and then they all stood up and walked out. And that was one of the scenes that just grabbed me and I thought there is, this deserves to be described. It was moving and it was also um, intriguing, you know, what was that about? What were they performing there? Um, because of, they would have been aware that he couldn't really have seen them, or not all of them. And so, you know, was it for themselves? Was it for the court? Mm. Who was it for? Part of the sadness. But it mm. is part of the way that people are participating in the court process. And I think people can assume that Aboriginal people um, are just completely oppressed by the law. Um, I, I have seen many Aboriginal people use the court processes to achieve something, including punishment of perpetrators, and uh, they can call for much harsher punishments than are actually delivered by the judges. Um, but also showing the ways that they support one another through the process. So family crowding into the galleries, following cases which can be tedious and complicated and no doubt very painful at times but being there together. So there are lots of ways that people are using the court process. Active. Yeah, yeah active. Yeah. Yeah. We might um, move through to our Q&A part now. Um, we've got a few people, uh, three people in the audience who have prepared questions. So we might move through those quickly and then I'll open up the floor for people um, others who would like to put questions to Kieran as well. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to start by, by saying that um, if people can keep their comments brief, um, 
and when it comes time to ask your own questions, to think of questions that are about the writing and the themes in the book as opposed to individual cases. Um, we really want to be careful not to um, hurt anybody in this festival. Okay. Um, so, first of all, we might ask Jane Lloyd to pose a question to Kieran. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Kieran, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. So, Kieran, your book, Troubles on Trial in Central Australia, provides a deeper insight into the complexities of the violence, just as you've been speaking, and it makes a case for more complex responses. You write about the need to understand the perpetrators of the violence and killings, and they're both male and female, although predominantly men and to better understand what motivates them. Can the facts of the cases you describe, that is the nature and context of the violence that resulted in the death, contribute to a more nuanced understanding of what may have motivated the perpetrator? Thanks, Jane. Um, I think uh, they it can to a degree and this isn't to get to um, a position of being able to theorise um, generally, but I think um, the facts, and particularly uh, when you get to the point of hearing the, what they call the antecedents, so it is the life of the person to date. Now, that depends a lot on the skill of the lawyer, the relationship between lawyer and client, how well that's presented, um, it can depend on how willing the defendant is to say something and there is a case at the end of the book it's the most disturbing before I reach the epilogue so it is a, a mob killing um, where we had uh, for the most part very little insight into what had motivated that the defendants did not through their lawyers put much before the court by way of an explanation for motivation. Uh, we heard a little bit about um, their lives to that point. And um, it's particularly in the accounts of lives to the point of the crime, and it often includes, uh, when you get crimes of that seriousness, it often includes quite a long criminal history. Um, with escalating uh, violence over decades, even. Um, but a lot of other, n no one's going to be surprised by this, a lot of other trauma in people's past, um, separation um, of parents, parents who've died violent deaths, um, children growing up with violence all around them, children growing up in very alcoholic communities where parents, uncles, aunties, siblings are drinking, heavily drinking. There can be a dearth of sober witnesses around a crime to provide evidence. It can be next to impossible to find a sober witness a crime um, but Jane and I had a conversation the other day and she reminded me all of the cases in my book uh, um, alcohol does feature I didn't choose them for that reason that it, it happens and we know that there is a very strong link um, circumstantially that the, the violence is often accompanied by heavy drinking but not always I don't have an example of that um, so for all of those reasons, um, I think we can understand that people needed high degrees of care along the way that they weren't getting, either from family um, or from the broader society. Um, so that is one way in which I think we have to accept that the crime is rooted in our community. Um, in terms of, and our, by our community, I don't just mean um, our 
broad, I mean our communities plural, I suppose, because Aboriginal communities also, ha you know, have to take their responsibility in this as much as um, they are under pressure. There, no other community like theirs can make the, such a difference, you know, in terms of taking charge um, and we need to give them all the support that they require to be able to do that. Um, I should just say something though about men killing women. Um, most of the cases in my book aren't about men killing women, but um, there's, I think, no doubt that that kind of violence has its own context to do with the relationships between men and women, the uh, power differential in those relationships, and that the violence has often been there and again escalating to the point of the killing and um, that really needs to be tackled head on, that violence between men and women. Um, it, the, there is a very gendered pattern in the violence in um, Aboriginal, intra-Aboriginal intra killings where and Jane has uh, written about this herself. I, I quote her research in the book, um, the pattern of violence to the head and upper body for women and um, often the, the stabbings um, and in the thigh for men. Um, but that vulnerability of the violence to the head, and this is happening even when people are terribly drunk, they are still the men are still mainly targeting the women on the head. And of course they're tremendously vulnerable to die as a result. And, and it, it also came out, um, you, you explored the um, criminal history of, of some of the people coming before the court for a particular trouble or violent event and then you look back in their history and there's a, a pattern of um, assaults against their intimate partners as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I won't say more about that because I think I've... Covered it. I yeah. think I have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did that answer your question, Jane? Yeah. 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 Uh, can we hear from uh, Harold Ferber now? Harold, if you have a question ready. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'd just like to congratulate you, um, Kieran, on your powerful uh, book and its attempt to um, describe the describe unbiasedly the disorder or the troubles, as you call them, in our community. It is, of course, understandable that we all come with our, our individual biases and and such to such a deep and troubling topic. And I, and I must say that it is somewhat troubling how these stories are to be taken, digested and analysed. And you've talked about that. What's troubling for me is do they provide fodder to the anti-Aboriginal commentary? Do they provide fodder to the anti-male Aboriginal stereotype written large across the Australian narrative? Do these stories provide for a fuller and franker discussion of the <coughs> sorry, deeper causes, deeper causes and effects that are taking place between the settler and indigenous. Are they really a window into the troubles that we should all learn and come to an understanding about? Sorry, there's all a bit loaded there. <laughs> um, thanks, Harold. Well, I think you've captured the challenge of the book and in in many ways, um, it might not be for me to answer. I know um, that weighed heavily on my mind and I've been um, confronted about it before. Um, and ultimately, it came for me, it was a choice. Do I write this or not? Do I you know, try to do what I can do with the material 
um, approaching it in the way that I do, <coughs> in that, in the tone that I establish, I hope to establish for being able to talk about it, um, because without a doubt it is an incredibly serious problem in the community. Um, do I do that or not? Um, I'm very reluctant to feed stereotypes and it uh, is part of what to just feed the stereotypes. I would hate it for the book to only fall in that way. Um, it's a, the burden of the responsibility of the book. I can't necessarily control how it falls either, but it's part of the reason why I wrote the um, quite long introduction, um, which I hope gives a picture of um, Aboriginal life and life of the town that isn't completely framed by the trouble, um, that does point to the many of the deeper relationships, um, some of some of the beauty of living in this place and what it gives people. So, whether I've succeeded or not, that is the question. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Harold? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's an it's an important question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's hard to find. Yeah. Okay. That's mm -hmm. the point. The first. The first. The first uh, chapter you referred to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It talks about some of the things we do quite substantive in this town, but there's no, uh, we couldn't find any Aboriginal people mentioned, uh, male, sorry. Well, the Mervyn Rabuncha is mentioned yeah. by name, yeah, mm. as one. Mm. I take your point, Harold. Thank you. If we can find Frances Conklin <laughs> for her question. Ah, oh, there you are. Um, my name's Frances Coglin and thanks Kieran for this opportunity. Um, I have a brief comment first. <laughs> the law is a, a narrow lens through which to understand and examine some very culturally complex incidents. Um, and I'm wondering if another lens might be more helpful when it comes to, you know, building strong, resilient, safe, sustainable community. Um, I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm going to just quickly comment on one incident in the book. If we, if we could keep away from particular right. okay, incidents, okay. if that's possible. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I mean, the court has a job to do when people offend. Um, you know, offenders have to be held to account for crimes and punished. People have to be punished. But now I'm wondering, is it important to try to bring a broader, different lens to some of these incidents? to understand the lead up, how this happened, could it have been avoided, what might have been helpful in terms of containing some of these conflicts, and I'm thinking of sort of broader community conflict. Um, and now looking at what is the, con the consequence for families that have been displaced, communities that have had people exiled, and also for our community here in Alice Springs, what's the consequence here in terms of just the ongo ongoing living here together? So the consequence of, oh, I think this has dropped. Mm. Has it? <laughs> the consequence of um, telling the stories 
Fran? What is the consequence of telling the stories as I've told well, the stories? Well, I wonder what, what would it be like to bring a different lens to some of those stories? Um, I think the legal lens brings a particular perspective, but there are other lenses that could be applied. For example, you know, an anthropological lens. You, you sort of have answered that in some part, talking about trauma, displacement. Um, I'm actually, mm. uh, well, I think I understand wh where Fran is coming from. Um, I wasn't quite aware that we had to stay away from the actual mm. cases, um, but, it, yeah, okay. So, I think, uh, it's out there, it's in the book. Yeah, it, and it, um, I think Fran is particularly talking about a case that involved um, a community uh, where she has worked, where she has strong and long-lived relationships and where she has a lot of prior knowledge to leading up to the events that brought this case to court. And um, I accept absolutely that other lenses are helpful. This is in no way the last word. Um, you know, I, I could have spent, I suppose, a decade doing a, a different kind of book that might have taken the court cases and then gone out and researched, interviewed and so on. It really wasn't the task that I gave myself and in confining myself to the courts um, I think it allows a focus on that particular relationship between people in our region and the courts um, and it, it contains the story it, in a particular way and allows for a level of focus but I think I write that in I'm very aware that we are, it's limited the extent to which we know the facts um, of people's lives and, and events and circumstances. But again, it comes to a choice of um, with the material that was before me, would I write it or not? And would I write it in the best way that I could with that material to hand and um, offer it as part of the debate or feel like it's all too complex to be talked about. Because um, as far as I know, there isn't another book like this um, to you know, have this kind of discussion around. There are other books with other important discussions that would flow from them, but one that with this kind of focus of people's experience in the courts and around um, troubling, violent events in, in the context of Central Australia. Mm -hmm. And where you were. Yeah, where I was. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Does anybody else in the audience have a question for Kieran? We've got a question here. I'll just try and paraphrase with volume. Um, so the question was about restorative justice and, and whether, I suppose, uh, the book goes into those kinds of principles as a way of um, dealing or contending with the trouble. Alternatives to the paradigmatic... You know, um, Adversarial... Yeah. Um, not restorative justice um, 
and I'm not even sure to what extent that um, would be pursued in cases around homicide. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm ignorant, really, in that area. The one alternative where I do give um, a fairly detailed picture is um, the um, so-called smart court that was used uh, to address offences at the magistrate's court level, so lower level offences where drugs or alcohol were involved and um, it existed for a very short time and was dissolved um, by the previous uh, Conservative government that has, um, was voted out of office last year. When they came into office they dissolved it almost immediately without evaluation. Um, they saw it as a soft on crime option. I saw it as a way of um, delivering um, the care around dealing with um, criminal behaviour um, that is, you know, so otherwise lacking. And it was very touching and um, interesting to observe the completely different atmosphere in the court, um, both affecting the people who um, had been uh, found guilty of their various offences, or they're all property offences, not violent offences. Um, and um, so the way in which that court transformed both them um, in those appearances and, and the court personnel, including the magistrate dealing with them, um, just that ability to be offering a, um, a six month window of support for that person to take hold of their life, make the changes necessary, quite intensive support at the same time as requiring um, zero substance uh, abuse. So it had its discipline uh, built in with urine testing and so on. Um, I thought it was very impressive in its results that I could observe and then it was dissolved without evaluation. It's very frustrating, frustrating. Um, but I think we will see a return of something like that soon. And the push was on for it to be extended at least to lower level violent offending, where it could really make quite a big impact in the Northern Territory. Because we have a very high level of violent offending and it is offending that sends people to jails. And it's a lot of the reason why the incarceration rate is so high. That answered your question? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And while you're walking, I'll just uh, clarify, um, Danny's clarified for me that questions are fine about particular cases, but just not debate about those cases. Hmm? Hi, Kieran. Um, I was interested in um, how you arrived at the voice at the writer's voice for this book and you talked early on about um, that outrage prevents thinking and you talked about uh, wanting to be compassionate but not sentimental and you talked about it not wanting to be too journalistic or m in more depth so I found the tone like the restraint in the book made the violence almost more chilling mm -hmm. and I was just really interested in how did you arrive, how did you decide what tone and how did you maintain that tone in the book? I'm interested in um, that uh, comment that you found it more chilling and I don't, I hope um, that I wasn't sort of manipulating it towards that. Um, it's, it is really hard to write about um, the degrees of the violence and um, the only way that I could tackle it was to be very restrained, no embellishment. Um, but of course, there is nothing really more dramatic in human affairs than a killing. Um, and it is utterly chilling. And sometimes in court, you know, you can feel it in everybody. It, it's, you can feel it in everybody's body, the tension that's there around these events. Um, 
but I was just reflecting the other day when we had an event uh, here to honour the contribution to scholarship in Central Australia by Dick Kimber, who's a man of you know extraordinary uh, in intellectual contributions in this community, in particular in the area of history and ethnography. Um, and but he published uh, has published quite a lot in the Alice Springs News Online of stories that were very controversial in the community. Um, uh, and I'll just mention the one example, the Coniston Massacre. Um, at the time of the uh, 75th anniversary, um, he published a long series in Alice Springs News Online. And I've had a lot to do with Dick through that publishing um, and sub-editing his work, which required next to no sub-editing, of course a meticulous writer, um, but the tone that Dick achieved um, for talking about very difficult things. And here often the, you know, the uh, violence that he was talking about in that instance was mostly perpetrated on the white side. And um, to try and get the, in a small community often defensive about its past to get this material out there in the public domain to be thought about, to be known about in detail. He found that tone. I think it was um, very exemplary and I think I took it on board. I think it was a great example to me when I went into the courts and started doing my own accounts of very difficult things. That's it. Who else has a question for Kieran? Yeah. Stand. Oh, if I stand, I'm very tall. Uh, I'm the tall one. Fiona. Um, uh, Kieran, thank you. Um, one of your comments in regard to the audience was um, who the book's for, was that you were looking for politicians, the judiciary policy makers. Sorry, I'm shaking this book. Uh, is makes me anxious. I admire it enormously and Kieran's bravery in, in writing it and sharing it. Um, but in that, Kieran, the, that, that, that their approach would be one of care compared to punishment in a, and uh, appreciating the complexities and humanities. Can you tell us what some of the responses of those in judici judiciary and policy and politicians have been, not just their responses to the book, but where they've been able to engage with potential changes as a consequence of understanding this much more complex and humane background you've given them? Um, I really can't. Um, I know that, um, for instance, the Chief Justice um, has read the book, um, but I haven't had a conversation with him and I'm probably unlikely to. It's not easy to get to talk to the Chief Justice. Um, I, I know he has read it and appreciated it, um, but of course he doesn't set policy. Um, politicians do, um, and I really, I do know that um, uh, MLA Dal Wakefield has read the book. Before she was voted into office, she said, after the election, well, we'll see what happens, but I'd like to have a conversation with you about the book. And I think now that she's a minister, we're unlikely to have that conversation. <laughs> but I am um, grateful that she's read it. And I know that she found the book valuable. Um, I know that uh, former, I know quite a few senior police officers have read the book, um, including the former, um, I think she was uh, assistant commissioner down here, Jeanette Kerr, who has now gone across to a senior position in Territory Family. So, it has been read and presumably thought about at those levels, but I think it's early days to see, draw any conclusions about what possible influence it might have. And I think for many people it would be tapping into 
their own thinking, but perhaps you know the occasion to have it consolidated or particular stories around which there could be a, a deeper reflection, but people would have been looking for um, or already tending towards, the people who've read it, already tending towards this kind of thinking about the situation. Um, I do hope that out of the present government um, we will get um, a, a new court that addresses uh, substance abuse and support for people around dealing with that. Um, that is one thing that I'll be on the lookout for, certainly. But meanwhile, we are living um, with a, a lot of the legacy, of course, of the previous government, including a monstrous new Supreme Court <laughs> <laughs> building. <laughs> me a bit anxious too but um, I just wanted to ask a question yesterday in one of the panels we we're talking about who can write about what who has permission to write and as a fiction writer it's often asked of me you know should I write about Aboriginal characters should I write about life here just as a fiction writer so as a non-fiction writer and my answer always is that I know about here and so I'll write about what I know about here can you talk about how you arrived at your decisions around permissions in the book because not everybody is always named not everybody who goes to court is named some people are named and some people aren't and how you generally dealt with that idea of writing about you know where, where we where do you sit on this idea of whose stories we are able to tell I suppose um, I, I asked the question in a out of a genuine kind of like a, I, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a great question. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a peren perennially difficult area and Harold has um, challenged, uh, drawn our attention, I think, to one of the challenges around representation and and what can be drawn from it, the responsibility of that, um, and inevitably the limitations of what you can do in any one book. Um, around the naming of people, well, you know, I really did agonise it quite a bit over that, but basically the defendant, almost all of the defendants um, are pleading guilty. Um, Almost all of these cases had degrees of um, coverage here in our region anyway. The, in terms of the naming the witnesses, it would have been such a quagmire not to. So I'm operating within the principle of open court. I know um, I would hate to be in that position myself and have to have my pain exposed in that way. I do really feel for people, but again it came to a choice of do I write this or not? And it was really quite impossible to attempt to write the kind of book giving an account of the complexity of the events, the violent events, um, while suppressing names. And, um, you know, we just would have lost track of what was happening without a name. So could I have made up names? Then there's the risk of confusing that person with somebody else who's not at all involved. So I did ponder that and in the end just made the choice to go with that principle of open <coughs> court, reporting from open court in what I hope is the most responsible fashion that I could do it. Um, and um, with the respect for people as, you know, fundamental human respect for the people. I get, and I guess um, I have to be judged on that. I was asked at one stage by the publisher to seek permissions. This book never would have been published 
Um, and again, I made the choice uh, on the basis of the principle of open court that what is stated in court can be put out there for, and there's a reason for that. It's an important part of our justice system and we don't often sort of see it taken up in the spirit that it's there for, which is, you know, for greater understanding of the ways in which um, trouble in the community is being dealt with. You know, we're often seeing it taken up for sensationalist reasons or vicarious reasons rather than, um, yeah, greater understanding. Thank you. We have one question here. <laughs> Hi, Ellie Moss. Um, I was wondering if you experience, have you experienced, do you experience empathy from the judiciary? Um, so do you mean, or, yeah, do you mean from the bench or all of the sort of legal profession involved? No, particularly from, from the, the bench. bench. Um, yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, I've seen, perhaps in the lower court, some pretty hard-nosed, um, disrespectful judgments at times, but in the Supreme Court, um, they're very experienced um, in dealing with very dire matters, and um, I do think that, on the whole, there was empathy. Uh, balanced, you know, empathy for defendants, but balanced um, with the empathy. They have to find the balance because of the needs of the victim for justice to be delivered. So, you know, um, I think in the um, Probably the most fraught case to have occurred in our community is the killing of Kumanjai Ryder. And in, um, Chief Justice at the time, Martin, um, said, you know, there are no winners and there really are not. I don't, nobody really gets comfort, uh, you know, when you're s dealing with a killing. It's just pain from beginning to end. There's no, there's no satisfaction really to be had there. I think he had um, a great deal of empathy. Something that I raise in the book is that um, I think w one measure of comfort that I think victims, families um, want and require from the court system is an acknowledgement of the personhood of that victim. And unfortunately, um, I have, don't know why, when I think he was a compassionate judge, um, and I think he held um, the vic uh, victim's mother, Therese Ryder, in the highest esteem. I think he had immense empathy for her anguish, um, but he did not take the opportunity to represent the life of Kumanjai Rider, and I know that was a specific hurt that um, she spoke about after the case. She wanted the court to talk about her son. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's something that um, the, the courts should do, uh, should really bear in mind um, that they, that is a measure of comfort to deliver to the victim, mm. to the victim's family. That's our time. Yes, time flies. Um, that's all we've got time for in this session. So I'd just like to thank everybody for coming along and, and your questions prepared and off the cuff. Uh, that was wonderful. And thank you so much, Kieran, for coming today and also for your beautiful book. Thanks very much. Yeah.